Ed, I'm so excited to interview you. This has really been a podcast I've been looking forward to and you're just amazing. You have such a nice way of teaching people very important principles, but you make me happy. That's what I told you before we started. When I listen to you, I feel happy. I feel like I can achieve things. I can do things. I feel motivated for the day. So thank you for coming on this podcast and it's just so great meeting you. The feelings are mutual and I'm really grateful to be with you as well. I've been looking forward to this. It's been on my calendar for a little bit and it's one of those things on your calendar. You go, okay, I'm looking forward to that one. That's going to uh, be the highlight of my day. So, Oh, great. That's so nice. And oh, no, I'm so glad as well. Well, Ed, can you just tell my audience a little bit about you and tell us something that's not in your bio? You know, give us, tell us what you do, but, you know, give us some little tidbits that aren't in your bio. Okay. Well, certainly I don't know what's in my bio, but I bet none of my failures are. And it would be a much longer <laughs> bio <laughs> if all of my failures were in there. But I think probably one of the things that's important to understand maybe why I do the work I do is I did had a great upbringing, but I grew up in an alcoholic family, as I know you know about me. Yeah. But I really think that was formative and shaped me. And I'm sort of Mm -hmm. well known for saying that everything happens for you, not to you. I really am a believer of that. And probably one thing that's not in my bio that would probably be of interest to people is I was an athlete. I was a college baseball player, kind of thought I was going to be a professional one. And my dad got sober. I had moved back home with my parents. I was kind of in that stage that maybe a lot of people listening is like, I can't believe I'm back with my parents again, you know, and I was, <laughs> I was living there. I don't think they were excited about it either. And my dad went to his first AA meeting. He comes back wow. from the meeting and he goes, I got you a job tomorrow. Get out of bed in the morning and go over to this place in, in San Dimas, California. I yeah. said, what is it? He goes, you don't get to pick. You just go. Whatever they tell you to do, you do it. Anyway, I show up there. It's an orphanage. And there's hundreds of boys at this orphanage. And I end up in cottage eight. Cottage 8 changed my life. I walked in. I I mean, here I am almost 50 years old. I've told this story many times, but I get emotional almost every time because these boys are in my soul. Yeah. I walk in and there's 10 boys. They're all 8 to 10 years old. All of them were taken from their families, Mm -hmm. molested by their parents, Mm -hmm. or their parents were dead or incarcerated. And they turn and look at me. They got these eyes. I think all kids that grow up with some dysfunction, even if it's just anxiety in your house or poverty, Mm -hmm. You have those eyes. They Mm -hmm. want to be loved. And I have those same eyes. And all these boys wanted was to be loved, believed in, cared for, and someone show them how to live their life better. And it was this tremendous blessing for me because I instantly, I was there for when they come Christmas day, I was there when they opened presents. I walked into school every day. I was their father. That's so nice. Yeah. And it changed me as a man. I fell in love with people and serving people. And both you and I, our work is basically very similar in, in mm-hmm. that, you know what adults want? They want people to love them, believe exactly. in them, care about them and show them how to live better. Exactly. And that's what I started to do with my life. And so here we are. Oh, I love it. I love that. That's such a beautiful story and so touching because it just shows you how the simple things in life, caring for people really are so important and how that just revolutionized how you've approached life, just seeing what those boys needed and you met a need. That was what a great thing that your dad did. I mean, how cool yeah, is that? Well, the greatest thing he did is get sober and my dad's been sober yeah. now for 30 plus years. That's but amazing. It, I wasn't an entrepreneur yet. And so it helped me when I became one and I became one while I worked there. It uh, uh, altered my approach. You know, I came at entrepreneurship and business from a perspective of like legitimately wanting to serve, wanting to show people how to live better, wanting to solve their problems. And it really prepared me, ironically, for being an entrepreneur in a way that you would not imagine working at an orphanage would, but it did for me. So it was a great blessing. Oh, that's amazing. You know, it makes me think of a study that is something that I quote quite often, which not many people talk about, but I know you'll be very interested in this. And that's that, you know, you, you've, your career hasn't been one of chasing the money. It's been chasing, helping people. And there's actually research showing that when you focus on helping others, when you get the I, me, myself, and I out of the equation and you recognize it's me in the world, you actually increase your own mental healing, physical healing, and functionality by up to 68%. Isn't wow. that amazing? So, you're going to send me that study. That's I know. It's it's a fascinating study and and also in my own recent research because I do clinical trials we also found the same sort of thing that when people manage their mind they actually immediately want to just help others there's this natural outflowing and then their own it boomerangs back and their own healing and things change so you know you're you're an example of that and you reach so many people with that so I'd be interested in your take on this because I have this other philosophy too that you know for some people they go to a party they think alcohol will reduce their anxiety or their, you know, their worry level. For me, my anxiety is always reduced when I'm in the service of other people. I don't Love feel that. as insecure. My insecurities go away when I, there's such a power in life to intention. Mm, and I, I think enough people, I don't feel like enough people in life give themselves credit for their intentions. 
Mm. There, there's this loop. They go, I'll believe in myself when I achieve. Well, if, yeah. if it's this loop you're chasing. So my self-confidence oftentimes comes from, you know what? I may not be completely perfect at the way I'll deliver this message, or I may not be the expert of all experts, but I intend to serve you. And I think people feel your intention. And yeah. enough people listen to this, you just need to give yourself more credit that you're a good woman. You're a good mm. man. You intend to make a difference. And that's, mm. you're worthy of success based on your intent. Mm, and the world needs so more good. people of good intent. We don't talk about intentions nearly enough anymore. I think that's a very good point. I think you've raised a very good point because intent has such impact. And if your intentions are coming from that place of authenticity and identity where you actually recognize you've got value and something to offer, it has such tremendous impact and a, a positive impact. So I agree with you that it's to be intentional about being in the world. You know, there's also other studies showing that people that have that more community, intentional community kind of focus, they do so much better than people that have that I, me, myself and I focus. In fact, the I, me, myself and I focus increase the chance of getting cardiovascular issues by 40 plus percent. So the individualistic society we live in that you and I try and teach against, where we try and get people to get out of themselves and reach out to others and connect with others. When we, fo- however we live in this world where it's me, myself and I, and we're not designed for that. And if you ask someone in, in the United States, what do you what do you want out of life? It's always my goals, my dreams, my... So it's a lot of I focus. Whereas if you ask someone in, say, Japan or something, the same questions, they'll say the impact I can make in community. And as you're talking, I'm thinking that's what your thinking is. You think like that. And it's very evident in your in your delivery and in your content that you're thinking about what can I do for my community? So it's not about me, but what can I do about for my community? Yeah, I can't, I, I, in all transparency too, I, I'm sure that there's elements of me where I'm putting my own interests in, in things that I do, but I don't feel like I've just be candid with you. I'm on the other side of those things at this age of my life of getting things for me. None of them ever filled me up. Yeah. It's not that, it's not that I don't want people to be wealthy. I do. I think you can give more if you're wealthier, Exactly. I, more successful, you've got more influence, but this notion that you're going to change the way you feel by doing things for yourself is a fallacy. And you've got the scientific evidence to prove it. I've just sort of in real life applications sort of proved it. And then, you know, when you do make a lot of money, you are around a lot of people who have achieved that dream stuff. Yeah. And you realize, my gosh, how unhappy so many of them are that just went for stuff that went for the eyes and me's of life. It's Mm. hollow and empty. And they find mm-hmm. themselves, you know, in their 50s and 60s going, wow, I invested all this time of my life yeah. chasing something I thought I wanted and it didn't give me what I thought it would. And mm. so you're so right. That's so key. What you've just said is so key. And, and you work with a lot of very high-powered people. And so you you hearing and seeing this all the time. And I was having a similar conversation with someone else who's very, high, who's very high-powered, very famous recently. And they just said that they look around the community that they work in and they said they're pretty much very similar words to what you've said. So yes, we do need the money because we can give more and help more and do more. But at the end of the day, it really is about that connection, isn't it? I mean, it's really- Absolutely, 100%. And it's funny when yeah. I do work with We'll just use the entertainment industry, for example. And they they will come to me and say, you know, I, I have achieved this. I have done that. Why am I not happier? And even when I present the concept of what fills your soul, what do you do in service of other people? Mm. They look at me almost like I'm a Martian initially, like it's almost <laughs> never been said to them. And wow. that's not a negative thing. It's, it's this revelation. Yeah. And it's so beautiful to watch a human being transform over six mm. months to a year or so of working with them. Like, my gosh, I, I love this. And I always tell them, you're so blessed that you've got the platform or the access and the connection yeah. to so many more people in the capacity you're in. And that's when I really feel like the work's rewarding for sure. Oh, I love that. Well, that makes me want to ask you this question. You've interviewed some of the greatest peak performers across all industries. And not just it's not just one industry. You really interview across industries like business, health, sports, politics, science, entertainment, etc. What are some of the best pieces of advice that you've heard or something that has really stood out to you that's changed you? Besides what you just said, I mean, you just made already made one super good, you know, super important point. It's interesting. When I started the show, I'm going to surprise you right now. When I started the show, I thought it's going to be a, a lot of the people I knew already. Yeah. But I thought, I wonder what they're all going to have in common. Is it hard work? Is it, is it you know, uh, brains? Is it intellect? Is it yeah. you know, connections? And I have to tell you that the shocking thing for me in getting to know, to your point of these achievers. Yes. The number one, I was just sharing this with the someone that you and I know mutually. And I, I said to him, I said, you know, the common thing, if there is a common thing, a skosh of depression, is that not shocking? And he goes, you have to be kidding me. And I said, no, because oftentimes it was how many home runs can I hit? 
How many Oscars can I get? Can I get elected to this political office? And there's a little bit of, and you, if you watch my show, some of them end up opening up about it on the show while we're recording. And then oftentimes it's behind the scenes. The other thing though, on the wow. positive side that I would say they have is they have a degree of self-confidence that is higher than a baseline performer. Um, and whatever it is they do, they've got a, they've got this, I don't know if you want to call it swagger or deeper belief in themselves, yeah. their ability to perform. And so it's ironic that there's these very confident people that is their separator. Mm -hmm. They're more confident. You take a guy like in baseball and Alex Rodriguez, who hit, mm -hmm. you know, almost 700 home runs. What's the difference between Alex and an average performer in baseball? It's his self-confidence level. No mm -hmm. question about it. So you take a look at Stephanie McMahon, who's, you know, one of the biggest CMOs in the world. She, She's one of the female billionaires traveling planet Earth right now. Yeah. It's her self-confidence. It's the it's it's her ability that she believes that she can perform at a high level. Dirk Bentley, the country singer, it's his confidence level. He does it, in it mm -hmm. with humility, but it's his confidence level. But, you know, quite frankly, I think even if you watch my interview with Stephanie, towards the end of that interview, she actually says, I think maybe I suffer from some mild depression. I find myself wow. some mornings not wanting to get out of bed. This is on the show, so I'm not saying anything that's out of school there. No, no, I'm no. So, I was so proud of her for our authenticity and transparency, but I think sometimes that was the common thing. Not all of them, but almost like, hey, can you help me, you know, off camera, can you help me be happier? Can you help wow. me be happier? That's the most common question I'm asked by my guests when mm -hmm. we're either before or after. And some of them come on the show literally hoping to meet me to become happier yet they have to talk about how successful they are. So that was the real fascinating thing. And, and to wow. this day. It, that's incredible. That's that almost like paradox. And it's like a paradox, isn't it? It's like the, on the one side, depression and on the other side, confidence. So there's a, there's like an imbalance. They're swinging between the two, but you know, depression is a signal that something's going on. So there could be just a lot of cognitive dissonance inside. Or, I mean, there's millions of different reasons why people, there's, no same reason why someone is depressed. But that's fascinating what you say, that the depression and the self-confidence, and that actually then levels the playing field and normalizes, because that's one of the things I try and do is to help people recognize depression is part of life. You know, it's not some illness. It is actually an ex a warning signal that something's going on in your life and needs to be addressed. Yes. And some of these emotions that we think are negative, I think you'd agree with me, like anxiety, like fear, in yeah. some cases aren't always bad things. There's Thank signals you. that we should be more aware of something. There's signals we need to respond a particular way. And the idea that we need to subdue all of these emotions in our life and not feel them at all steals living from us. And I so, love how you said that. Well, thank you. And I, I, I find that with people that I see, like, I have so much anxiety. I say, well, there's an extent and a degree to it that is not healthy. Mm -hmm. But let's see how much of it you actually really have. Let's unpack this. And how can we leverage it? How can it serve us? It doesn't have to go away altogether. And so that, those are all the things that you calibrate when you're coaching somebody. But in my own case, I, 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 you know, you and I are both looked at as people that, you know, show people how to live better. I'd be remiss. I have anxiety. I have worries. I have fears. Exactly. Sometimes they don't serve me and I need to address that. But oftentimes they do serve me. They cause me to improve. They cause me to grow. They cause me to course correct. They cause me to pay closer attention. And so some of these things aren't unhealthy necessarily at all when you have them. Well, I just want to say, want to leap here and say, yes, go for it, Ed, because you're one of the few people that actually is verbalizing that along with, like, I feel like sometimes I'm out there as a lone, lone person saying, hey, listen, anxiety and depression, embrace these. These are actually fantastic because they're messages. And when you embrace them, you actually demystify them. You take the sting out of them. You neutralize them. And then you take that energy, which drains your battery, and you now make it energy that works for you. And you've just said that. And it's science. These my my. My clinical trials show that you can actually take that and make it work for you. So that's exactly what you're doing. So I got so excited when you said that. <laughs> I'm glad we agree. We totally agree. That's fantastic. Okay. So if I had to ask you the question, is there a common mindset that you've noticed? Would you say the confidence is the mindset or, or could, or would you say something else? How would, would you? Okay. I'll give you something that I've been, I've been writing about a little bit. And I think it's one of the keys to happiness in life. It's one of the things I try to teach them because they're good at it, but they don't leverage it for themselves. They leverage it in their careers. Okay. So I'm going to, I'll say this to you. I find that most people in life at some age start to operate more out of memory than imagination. Mm, that's fascinating. Yeah. When we're children, I think one of the reasons we're so blissful when we're children is we're operating out of imagination and curiosity and not memory. And as we be, and so these people that achieve well in their careers, they're great at operating out of imagination and creativity mm. and possibility achieving. In their personal lives, though, 
they begin to operate more out of memory. It's almost like, do you operate out of vision or history in your life? And one of the things I'd ask everybody listening to this or watching it is, ask yourself that question. There becomes an age for many of us where it begins, and you know how the brain works better than I do, mm -hmm. but your brain is constantly trying to take it easy. It's constantly trying to say, this is that what it used to be. When we're reading, we're not actually reading the words, we're remembering words we've read prior. So in life, oftentimes we begin to operate this way where everything starts to operate out of memory and history as opposed to vision and imagination. And I think one of the keys to happiness and bliss in life is that you become conscious of beginning to operate more of your imagination and your vision and not just your history and your memory. Because what happens is you just begin to repeat your life. There's different cast of characters with different names and different circumstances and a different house, maybe you know a different age, but it's the same emotions. It's the same emotional homes. It's the same things you create. You become addicted to these emotions that you just recreate over and over again out of memory. And so mm -hmm. real simple thing I start asking people to do is just be conscious. Is this another thing? I'm operating out of memory. I'm operating out of history again. Mm -hmm. This happens, the same stimulus response happens in me and begin to create, begin to operate out of imagination like a child does. And I think you'll begin to start down a pathway where your life changes. The external part of your life can change when the internal part changes into an imagination and a vision and not a memory and a history all the time. Mm, that's brilliant. Operating out of imagination versus memory. And you can use the memory, but you must make sure that you're not operating just out of that memory. That's just, that's, I've never heard it put like that before. I love that. And well, it's true. Because I do. Humans are reflexive. We have reflexive responses. Exactly. The older we get, we've created more of these synapses and we've got more of this myelin that's hardwired us to absolutely respond the same way. Exactly. And it's got to become something that you're somewhat conscious of. And you just start. And one little key I would say to everybody is give yourself the gift. You know, if, you're, if you meditate every single day, one of the things I started doing about 10 years ago is I, have, I give myself the gift of an imagination session. It's just a dream session. That I'll give myself, what do I want my life to look like? What could I do? What are the possibilities? And oftentimes in those moments, someone will occur to me that I should just call and reach out. I love you. I miss you. I just was thinking about you. Like, beautiful things come out of these imagination sessions that I have. And it's, it's a mental muscle like any other one you could build, yeah. but you unconsciously have a huge memory muscle yes. and you can leverage it. And there is beauty in that, but there's also the part of life of creating life and, and, and seeing the new things in life that you haven't seen before. So this year is not like last year. And that's through imagination. So, Oh, I love that. And it, Einstein once said that imagination is unlimited. Knowledge is limited. So memory is limited, but, but imagination is unlimited. And as you say, we keep doing the same thing but, but until we interrupt it. So imagination is interrupting what we keep doing so that you can get you know, say, hey, should I be doing this still? Maybe I can do it in a better way. I love that. So that's a very basic look at if you're operating. So your advice, look at if you're operating out of memory or imagination and take an imagination, gift yourself with an imagination session every day. I love that. Gift yourself. I love how you said that. So five minutes, 10 minutes where you just let your imagination go. So when you were a child and you do it less and less as you become an adult. Yep, it's such a natural thing as a child. Look how children play. You know, we need to sit and watch how children play and how they imagine. I want to ask you about specifically, what are some practical and simple tips and strategies you can share on how to recover from the death of a dream? I find that fascinating how you talk about the death of a dream. How do you pivot? How do you know where to pivot to? And I'm going to say that, precursor that with just a statement that kind of wraps up what we've been saying. Because if I hear you correctly, people, I, th I want to ask you two questions. Let me start with this question, then I'm going to come back to the dream question. Because I want to ask you what you how you see this. There's so much focus on the external and you said it earlier, when I've achieved this, then I will be happy when I've done this. And people are looking to you, to me, to the world, to books, to self-help books. There's something out there that I've got to take and put inside me to be happy. But you've said repeatedly so far in the conversation, it's in you and you've got to get it out. Do you think society, so my question, first one, before the dream, because I think it's related, do you think society has created this focus, too much of a focus on the external and not enough focus on the internal, even if that's the right way to pose the question, but that concept, what do you think about that concept? I think it's beautifully said, and I couldn't agree with you more, and I've been, I've been susceptible to that as well. I'll give you something that I think society, that, that is in our culture that is so deep now, and that is that, and by the way, the future does this as well. And and it is this, I find I'm most happy when I'm the most present in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm stealing myself of any potential of real happiness when I'm not in a moment. And I have struggled with that in my life of being mm -hmm. present, always wanting to achieve the next thing, always wanting to go to the next and saying, wow, this moment's pretty special too. 
this place I'm in is pretty special. Loves it. I'm pretty special. My connection with my higher power, my energy source is pretty damn special too right now. Mm -hmm. And I do think what's sewed into our culture now is every possible type of stimulus coming at us that causes us not to be present in the moment, whether that's our social media, our phone, the mm -hmm. news, our vision, what, 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 the next thing mm -hmm. we're going to achieve, the messaging we get from other people. All of this stuff causes us very rarely to enjoy the moment we're in because so we get our phone from a previous moment someone else has already posted about. We've got to watch the news to see how bad this election is going to be for our future. Mm -hmm. Then we've got to be achieving these things that are out there in the future. And what happens, I think the last decade, many people would say, I look back at the last decade of my life and there were fewer and fewer moments I had that I actually enjoyed in the moment. We're so, wow. we're so wired now to, I better record this moment and show everybody how amazing it is rather than maybe sometimes just putting your phone down and be in that moment and, be in and it. you enjoy it. The vast majority of the mm -hmm. pictures we take, for example, in our life, we never go back and look at ever again a second time. And the reason pictures used to be so precious to us is they were rare. Exactly. So we would put them in the photo album and we'd spend hours actually looking at them. Exactly. And that was the beauty of it. Now there's yeah. a, I mean, even today, I probably have 30 pictures on my phone from something I did today. And those, yeah. every time I'm doing that, that's a moment I'm not in. And so that's I do so good. Really believe, and by the way, I think that suppresses growth. I think it suppresses yeah. emotional growth. It robs us from some of the neurochemicals that would make us the mm -hmm. most happy in those moments, if totally. not really enjoy them in their full capacity. And so, yeah, I think that's what's sewed into the culture. And I think one of those things is the future all the time, but it's not the only thing. Mm, that's so good. You know, if you look at the at, at the, the biggest part of us, our unconscious mind, it doesn't operate. It's 90% of who we are. And it's, it's it doesn't operate in the present, past or future. It operates in the now. And the the present, past. And so most of, most of who you are as a human is actually in the now. And then our physical operates in time. And it's, I know it's a paradoxical thing, difficult to put together. But when you put it together, that's why we're always drawn to the deeper stuff and why we get so much depression and stress and anxiety when we keep trying to operate. And doesn't mean you don't operate in time. I'm not saying throw the one out with the other. It's the blend of the two. But I think society's become so focused on the time and, and capturing the moment because time is passing that we've forgotten to enjoy the now. So, yeah. Oh, that is awesome. I love that. Very <laughs> good. I'm going to feel that. That's another another way of looking at it. So it's, but I'm so glad. So now let's pivot to the question on the dream because that is such a linked. It's so linked to that because people, that's my dream. I've got to achieve my dream, and then they don't get there, or the dream changed, and they don't they don't know how to adapt. Or I, there's just so much emphasis as well on almost over emphasis in the wellness industry and the self help industry. And you know, you've got to have a vision, you've got to have a dream, and you've got to achieve it. And I think people have distorted the whole concept. So I'd love your take on how do you, how do we deal with this and. Well, it's a great question, and, and it's a really difficult one. I, first thing yeah. I would say, you don't really want the dream. You want how you think that dream will make you feel. You want mm. It's not the jet you want or even the person you want. It's how you think they would make you feel. It's the emotions that you would like to feel, and you think if you get so those good. things, you feel those emotions. So the first thing that you should realize is that you can have, give yourself the gift of those emotions now if you do the work required to feel them. And you don't have to delay them into the future. The second thing is on dreams I've had that, you know, people would say ended and failed. Then maybe you've been in a marriage, for example, that was a dream of yours that's failed. Maybe you've had a business or a sport you were pursuing. Here's what I would say to you is that none of that took place for no purpose and to just die. That mm -hmm. there were breakthroughs, learnings, discoveries, relationships, connections, thoughts, skills potentially, mm -hmm. that you developed in the pursuit of that first dream that you think died. And if you would just turn the car around and go backwards a little bit, there were some side roads that you could go back down now that are connected somehow. Meaning mm -hmm. you're, you're in a relationship that was a dream of yours that didn't work. That wasn't just a dead relationship. That is preparing you for the next relationship and the behaviors, the things you want from that other person, how you want them to make you feel are now inside you that weren't there the first time. So that dream didn't die. There's a side road you're supposed to go back and take that's connected to it. In your business, there's somebody you met, if you had a business that failed, there's somebody you met, there's a breakthrough, there's a thought, there's a relationship, there's a connection, there's a skill set you've developed that leads you down the path of the next dream. And so what I have found is none of my dreams, for baseball, 
baseball didn't work for me, but my gosh, did it prepare me about getting there earlier and showing up later. My mental toughness of dealing with failure. When you play the sport of baseball, if you're good, you fail seven out of 10 times hitting, right? You you hit 300 in baseball, you're a hall of fame level baseball player. So it wired into me this ability to deal with failure 70% of the time wow. that most people that went into business and entrepreneurship didn't have. Mm. Um, my physical training, I learned about my physical body, visualization and the reticular activating system in my brain. I learned first in baseball when I was injured. So you could say, well, that dream died, but if I learned about the reticular activating system, I learned about visualization. I learned about dealing with failure in baseball that prepared me for the next dream. And so, so I would say to you, stop saying that dream is gone completely. There's a side road. There's something that took place there. There's a beautiful place. If we just go back a little bit, it'll probably lead us where we need to go. That's so good. I'm just going like, you know, mic drop. That, that's really, that's that's just helped so many people that are listening to this now. And and that's so vitally important because you've, you've actually just said nothing was a waste of time. There's that time factor again. Everything, even if it was painful and, and messy, there was a side road that you learned from. That's just fantastic. It's a, and it's a fact. And it, and, it and is a fact. We learn this later in our life, don't we? We go five we years do. Later, We do. We do. That did serve me. I think having present vision, in other words, being able to see things as they are now will yeah. make you much happier than having to wait the five years. Mm. You don't have to look back with revisionist history. You can operate out of your imagination now. That relationship you're in that was, I'll give you one example, and it's a, 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 a major one. One of my best, best friends, she has been married three times. Her third marriage is ending right now. Oh. And there's a part of her where she thinks, my gosh, I, I, I'm not any good at this. Mm. You know, this another dream has died. Yeah. But I must tell you, I, this just took place yesterday. We were talking and I said, I think you're more powerful, more beautiful, more articulate, more knowledgeable, more confident than I've ever seen you before, even though you don't see all of that in you. And what's happened is, although that's not the path you wanted when you were a little girl to have three marriages, yeah. the truth is she's learned a lot about how she needs to operate better in relationships. She's learned a great deal now that she'll date again about what she is never going to look for again in somebody. What she, Mm. she was always looking for them to give her these emotions that she could be feeling herself and they could celebrate them together. And so I'm not saying I want anybody to be divorced three times. But I'm saying there's been so much learning and so much growth for her that this next relationship, and by the way, it was interesting. I said, the first relationship, she was physically abused. Oh, wow. The second relationship, he cheated on her when she was pregnant. That's trauma. I mean, that's terrible trauma. Mm. Trauma. The third relationship, he just really wasn't who he said he was. Mm. But I said, I said to her, I said, let's just be honest. That's progress. Right. I mean, yeah. the worst case scenario was uh, drawing someone into your life who was physical with you. The next one is yeah. nobody would cheat that. The next one is he just wasn't who he said he was. I think we're ready now to find what we're really authentic. And so give yourself some credit. I mean, that's an extreme example. And that's why I share. Wow. Give yourself some example for progress. Give yourself mm-hmm. some credit for that. And your life is not over. Those were things preparing you happening for you. Just like my dad. Let me give you one little thing. My dad's yeah, alcoholism as a child, it was a great gift in it. And you think there's gotta be terrible anxiety and worry and stress. And there was, let me give you one of the crazy benefits of it. I, my dad would come home. I'd be a little four or five year old boy. I had little sisters and I'd want to protect them. Right. And I would have to read when my dad would come through the front door, I'd have to read him. Is this, this Mm. or is this happy, sober dad? And what happened is I started to build this ability as a little boy of reading people, of noticing people, of observing people. And that has served me hugely as a coach, hugely as an entrepreneur. I would never have this ability to connect, to read, to care, to observe people. Had I not had a dad that I had to observe every single night he came through the front door as a little boy. Gosh. So yeah, that, that was traumatic, but it made me who I am now. And that's what I mean by if we go back, there's roads and lessons and learnings and all these things in our life. I could just listen to you all day. I mean, this is just, you, you, you know, this is stuff that you're just saying, stuff that is, it's all in alignment with mind brain research that I do. And it's all, and it's also truth. You know, it's like, hey, that's, that's so logical. So, how do we get people to go from this is truth? I mean, we just, we, I, I resonate with it. And I know people listening resonate with it as well. How do we get people to shift that, their, their mindset to take the past and to say, okay, 
it was a disaster, but was it like you've just done now? What could, yeah, to look back, is, is it, how would you recommend people do that? Because I know people are listening to this and they're saying, okay, well, I, I want to do that. I want to do that with everything because it's a complete mindset shift. It's a mind change. It's instead of saying, oh, this always happens to me, this, and going down that rumination of you know, toxic rumination of just thinking how bad it is and one thing, and you just get all this chemical, everything just becomes a disaster in your brain and your body when you go keep going down that negative hole. So what, what is the key that we could give people now to help them shift? I think all of these thoughts that you're having that don't serve you are symptoms of a disease. And we need to, we have to quit treating these symptoms. We need to begin to treat the disease. And I don't mean to be corny when I say this. Yes. You, you need to love yourself more. You need to have more self-confidence. You need to know there's a purpose to you being here. You were born to do something great with yeah. your life. And I want everyone to hear what I just said. You were born to do something great with your mm -hmm. life. You mm -hmm. were. And you knew this at some point when you were a little girl or a little boy. And you've allowed these circumstances and these darn people in your life to convince you or to cause you to doubt whether that is true. And if we don't get you believing again that you deserve to be happy, you deserve to win, you were born to do something awesome with your life in big ways and small ways. And once you adopt that, this is truth that you were, that your soul, your spirit was born for a reason. Now we can start to develop that self-confidence and these things are not happening to you. Nothing's happening to you. You remember what I'm about to tell you, yeah. everybody. You are infinitely bigger than your thoughts and you don't have to believe everything you think. Let me say it to you again. You are infinitely bigger than your thoughts. You're, you're mm -hmm. this huge force and these thoughts are this little speck of pepper inside who you are. You are yeah. bigger than them. And what happens is you begin to think your thoughts are bigger than you and you begin to think everything you think is true. And it's just simply not the case. You are far bigger than these self-defeating, negative, confused, unresourceful thoughts you have. That is not who you are. You are much bigger than that. And when you get out beyond that and you understand that, now we're curing this disease of all these goofy symptoms of I'm not this, this happened to me, it'll never change, I keep doing this. Those are all thoughts that are smaller than you. And begin to think bigger thoughts. Give yourself some credit, give yourself some peace, and then you have to start to work on your self-confidence that I've talked about these other people. Yeah, and the way yeah. you do that, there's simple steps. You have to start keeping the promises you make to you. Forget everybody else. If you start keeping promises you make to you, when I meet someone who doesn't have self-confidence, I know instantly this person has a pattern of not keeping the promises they make to themselves. So, so if you keep a promise, and it could be baseline things that create momentum and celebrate them. You know more about this than I do, but so many people do things very well, give themselves no credit, get no dopamine hit. And then over time, because there's no reward, they just, they unconsciously decide they don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So if it's as simple as what time you're going to get up, what you're going to eat every day, when you're going to work, things you can control, how many people you're going to reach out to in a given day. If you're going to meditate for 15 minutes, do it. And then when you're done, give yourself credit for doing it. And the more you begin to trust yourself, here's your problem. You don't trust you. And if you begin to trust you, know you're bigger than your thoughts, know you were born to do something great and start to trust you. And you do that by keeping the promises that you make to you then everything external starts to transform in your life. And that's not rah-rah so or hype. These are no. facts. I've proven it with thousands of people, and it's true for you as well. So start keeping those promises. That's so simple, so basic, so powerful. I'm going to give you some visuals. Look at this. Thoughts are real, like you said. And I love the fact that you say, I always use this little tree. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Okay. So thoughts look like trees. And the memories are the branches in the tree. So one thought's a concept, and then all the memories associated with that, there could be thousands in there. And there's a, a root, which is your origin story. So now when you talk about those toxic thoughts that are symptoms that are like a disease, there's the toxic tree. So I always use these analogies. And these are real. These actually build into your brain. So and what you said there, that your thoughts are big, I'm just giving the science to confirm. I'm just, I'm just like supporting what you're saying, because I love how you said it. That when you said thoughts are like pepper in this universe, that is so true, because what you've just said is is so scientific. You use your mind to change your mind. So your mind is bigger than the thoughts because the thoughts are the result of your mind. So you use your mind, you build the thoughts, but the thoughts are pepper. So this is this is pepper that we actually like. We want to grow this into like a nice pepper tree. But this one we'd like to just, you know, this is the bad pepper. We want to get rid of it or whatever. So, it, and you've just explained the science in a very simple way of the non-conscious mind. This, this 
bigness and the little pepper. Brilliant. I love it. You're amazing. <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> well, I'm this... getting you on my show for sure. So, I can't wait. Well, I want to have you back on this show. You think you and I could talk all day. This stuff is fantastic. You just have such a simple way of, of stuff that, you know, like it just resonates. I'm just like, yes, I can do that. The path, I can just see the pathways into the past. And, you know, your memories are never quite the same either. Every time you think of something, they change. So you have this malleability in your memories that you control. So they pepper can be, con can be changed, you know. So it's so, it reminds me of my young, my second daughter who, when she was about I don't know, six months, it was whatever. She got hold of pepper and inhaled this pepper. And you can imagine a baby inhaling pepper. She didn't know what it was and the impact that it had. And I was thinking that just as you were talking about pepper, that vision came in my mind of the impact that these have, how they literally can blow your mind. And But you can get rid of it. You can get rid of those. You can rewire them, which is so, so cool. Oh, I love that. I th you, you basically answered this, but let's just tie this up because you have a great way of just sort of simplifying. What do you think are the most common mental mistakes people make that are hindering them from a achieving and fulfilling their goals the self-confidence thing or is it yeah doubt very difficult to execute in, a, in from a state of doubt i also you've used the word simple several times today we like to complicate things in our life and i think complexity is the enemy of execution oftentimes so I'm, not, good. I'm not the smartest guy in the world but i keep things pretty simple i make sure that they're true i make sure that they believe them and then i execute on them i think self-doubt is a huge thing that uh, many many people make the mistake of they also don't take control. You and I were talking off air a little bit about the reticular activating system in their brain. They're not aware of these filters that they have and the mm -hmm. filters that they can create. And the more that something becomes critically important to you, the more your reticular activating system will allow that to filter into your consciousness. If it's not important to you, it's going to filter it out to protect you, to keep you safe. And so, this, good, yeah. you know, there's this saying that your obsessions become your possessions. And there's some validity to that. And one of the things that I think people make the mental mistake of is not taking some form of control mm. over the things that they're looking for in the world. I'm, I, I'm not really good at a lot of things, but I'm pretty good at that, that I am regularly repeating to myself imagery of, and it's not even so much things I want anymore. It's more things that I want to feel, or for me right now, I'm a gratitude addict. I see that. I see that. You wrote a great, I was just actually reading it before your interview, but you're a really great one on attitude. I mean, gratitude. Yeah, I did that today. And I'm, so I'm constantly giving myself the gift of finding things that I'm really, really grateful for. And these are things that if they weren't part of my real awareness would be filtered, I wouldn't see them. I wouldn't hear them. I wouldn't experience them. So your reticular activating system mm -hmm. wants to deliver these things to you, right? It's a filter. Yep. And so right now I'm just really, really in this mode of grateful for people. And the reason I'm doing it to be candid is that I had started to drift with all of the unrest in the world mm -hmm. and all the strife politically going on. Mm -hmm. I started to drift into a point where I wasn't, I wasn't sure about people, all people mm -hmm. and their goodness. One of the benchmarks of my life has been that I believe the vast majority of people are good. Yeah. And I think if you watch the television right now or social media, it would be very easy to begin to doubt that yeah. our responses to one another are so intense. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I got to take control of this. I want to find people I'm grateful for. And I'm seeing them everywhere. I'll give you a quick example. I'm walking into the, the gym this morning and I'm on this gratitude, you know, yeah. a lady that walked in front of me, I'm going to guess that she was in her mid 80s. Okay. That's and, so uh, cool. Well, okay. I held the door. I held the door open for her. And she's in great shape, and and she kind of looked at me like with this flirtatious look. You know, I'm fifty, Jeez. so I don't get a look. Really <laughs> and, uh, and so I held the door open for her, and she goes, "It's just great to know that there's a gentleman left Aww. in the world." I said, "Well, that's my honor." Anyway, we start talking. Her name's Elaine. That was my grandmother's name. Aww. And I said, "Oh, I love that name. That was my grandmother's name." And and she tells me, she goes, "I think you might just be the most handsome man I've ever laid eyes." Oh, that's on. so cute. And I said, "Elaine, I think you're incredible. I think you're beautiful." And anyway, it ended up we went our separate ways, and then halfway through, we ended up working out next to each other. That is amazing. And we just had this amazing talk about her husband who had passed away many years ago, and she never dated again. And it was just this connection. That just filled my heart and oh. filled my spirit, you know? And it's because I'm looking for it. I, I, I could have walked right by her. Love I that. the door and had my headphones in and not pulled them out to talk to her, right? But, but because it's something I'm seeking, my reticular activating system is finding it for me. And so that's a biggie for me to help people change their life. 
Oh, I love that. You know, that, that story is just so moving. I, I just visualized the whole conversation and I love what you, how you explain that. And just some science behind that. Our brains are wired for love. I don't know if you've ever, ever read anything or heard about that, but we literally do not have a structure, a circuit, a protein, a subatomic particle, any part of our brain or our body that isn't wired for positiveness, for love. I, you know, I use the word love because it's such a broad word. It's not a, I'm not using it in the woo-woo sense. I'm using it that it's the positive constructive sense. So even if you're experiencing depression, if you embrace the depression and you make it work for you, that's actually in alignment with what the brain is designed to do. Which, so in other words, that we designed to make everything, there isn't a fear circuit in your brain that's making you fearful. There isn't a depression circuit in your brain that's making you depressed. The, that, that's just, it's impossible because that upsets the entire electrochemical and neurochemical and protein balance right down to the subatomic level, right down to literally the vibrations on the subatomic level. And the bell prize is actually going to the guy who did a lot of work in this area this year to, to Roger Penrose. He's actually, yeah, so he's one of my absolute heroes and one of the people I've studied for years. But the point here is that you are now, when you did what you did today, you've just done what you designed to do. We are designed to connect with others in this deep, meaningful way and to all great responses happened inside of your brain. So when you say your reticular activating system found it for you, it's true you 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 chose with your big mind to not let a pepper thought of I'm just going to do my own thing and you actually connected with someone and your reticular activating system is designed for that. So it responded and then worked with the other parts of your brain and you got this incredible response in your brain and your body which then fed back into your huge mind because your mind is separate from your brain but in but connected and flowed through and you had this whole response. Okay, so there's a little bit of the science behind it but it's it's just what it confirms what you do. This when people say, Oh, gratitude, everyone's saying be great. There's a reason why we need to reach out to others and be great and have gratitude and reach out to others, isn't there? I mean, there's a serious reason. I, I'm just sitting here thinking, I hope the whole world hears this conversation. This is really, really great. I love it too. It's fair. I agree with you. We got to get this out to the whole. This is such a good conversation. No, it's. It's it's fantastic. Ed, there's so many things I want to ask you. Okay, what do you what do you think we should still cover? How, I mean, I, I've got 20 questions here. Still, what do you feel you want to still share with with my audience based on what we've been saying? Well, I think I think one of the things that I would tell everybody is that I, I'd like them to begin to live a little bit more intentionally. One of the things that I I just dropped my son off at college, and when I dropped him off, I said, Max, I said, just remember this: remember who you are and what you stand for. And that'll help you make all the decisions in your life. Mm -hmm. And I want you to do it intentionally. I, I feel like one of the things that are, you and I both do, we're intentional about our life. We're, mm. we're, we want to expand. We want to grow. We're not afraid to try new things and new mm -hmm. thoughts and new breakthroughs. And we're curious people. And I would just say to the people that are listening to this or watching it at any, you know, wherever they are in the world, is that begin to become more intentional about what you want. Mm -hmm. If you want something from people, ask them for it. Tell them you need mm -hmm. it from them. I find so often people in my life are afraid to ask for what they need. They're afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to tell people, I need this. I want this. This is something I really need help with. And they're not intentional about getting things. And they just sort of live life mm -hmm. in the gray areas all the time. And I'm a big believer that all of the great things in life, if it's like a swimming pool, all the great stuff's buried in the deep end of the pool. You got to go into the deep end to get things in life. And the deep, you know, mm -hmm. when I was a little boy, I couldn't swim. I was like nine years old. I still couldn't swim at nine. And I always be in the, the this is a true story. I would be in the yeah. shallow end of the pool with these floaties on where all my buddies were in the deep end. Yeah. And they're all having all the fun. And I'm in the shallow end. Why was I in the shallow end? I was in the shallow end because I couldn't drown there. It was safe. Mm -hmm. The water was calm, right? Yet all of the cool things in life are in the deep end. And yeah, the water's rougher. There's a little bit more risk there. It's, you know, it's noisier, all that stuff. But I would just say to you, you've got to start to live your life in the deep end of the pool. And there's going to become a point in your life mm -hmm. where there's just less and less time to do it. I had a dear friend of mine, is Jesse Itzler, and we're both 50, so we're looking at time. I'm older than you, by the way. I'm seven years older than you. <laughs> well, you look 17 <laughs> years younger than me, which is not fair. That's you not look cool pretty good yourself. <laughs> I hope no one's actually watching. I'm your senior. Because if they see these two faces on the screen and you're older than me, that's going to freak some people out. No, you look excellent for your age. I didn't realize you were 50 either, so there you go. <laughs> oh, you trust me, you wouldn't. But anyway, years ago, my Jesse had said to me, he goes, he goes hey, listen, tr truthfully speaking, you're almost 50. How old your dad? I said, my dad's 74. And I, he said, well, 
you know, how many times a year do you see your dad? I said, what? He goes, actually see him, you and your dad yeah, alone. Yeah. Mom's not there. And I said, I don't know, three times a year. And he goes, okay, well, you know, your average age, your dad will live four more years. He goes, you're going to be with your dad 12 more times. Wow. I went, oh my gosh, 12 more times. You're right. Wow. And it, what it did is it made me intentional. Mm-hmm. You know, and all of a sudden when the phone rang and it was my dad, maybe if I was busy before, I'd call him back. And I'm like, hi, dad. I didn't always say, I love you, dad. And guess what happened within six months of that conversation? My dad got cancer. Oh, wow. And, and my dad, we've almost lost my dad a couple of times here the last few weeks. Wow, and sorry. He's but he's actually made a little bit of a rebound. But my point yeah. is, thank God I became intentional. Thank so God good. I, all the, I don't have all the time in the world to do things. I need to be present now with the people that I love. I need to mm. give myself and them the gift of the beauty of these great emotions now. And so I would just say, be more intentional. Time is running out. There's a window of life and it does close over time. And we're not, mm. and none of us are getting any younger. Begin to be intentional. Give yourself these gifts now and give it to the people around you that you love now. That's beautiful. Be intentional about what you do with your life now. That's so important. Don't you think that would help a lot with things like depression and anxiety and, you know, just the, because people are so caught up in worrying about it. And I'm not saying that that's going to go away. We're all going to worry. And there's constructive worry, as you know, and destructive worry. And destructive worry goes to anxiety and panic attacks, whereas constructive worry actually can be energy that you can use in the right direction. So I'm not saying not worry, but it's we can be so consumed in destructive worry that we don't enjoy those moments. And we've got to be intentional to what I'm hearing you say. We have to well, be What intention doing- does, yes. What, when I deal with people that are depressed, one of the common things they say to me is, I'm lost. Mm. And that means there's no intention to what they're doing. It's very difficult to be in, depressed when you're intentional because you don't feel lost. And That's so, very, very good. Yeah, it's it's and it, I found that to be true. And the other thing is, I said earlier to give yourself credit for your intentions. And one of the yes. things I always tell my son is, I told you when I dropped him off, I said, "Remember who mm-hmm. you are and what you stand for." There's such a power in life to congruency mm-hmm. that you are who you say you are, that you're authentic. And yes. you should give credit for that. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not. But pretty much who you see on social media or my show is who That's you would who you are. ran into me at the gym. And I, so I, I feel a sense of comfort and confidence that I'm living intentionally and I live in congruence with what I believe in and who I am. And you might do that as well. And you should start to give yourself a little bit more credit for it. And if you don't, that's the pathway to changing these emotions you don't want to feel anymore is live mm-hmm. in congruency live intentionally. And I think you'll see some change. I like that. I like that because everyone says be unique and be authentic, but you've said intentional and congruency. Those words are very deep and very powerful and very accessible. Well, the reason is I look at you, I'm, I'm thinking, why am I enjoying this so much? Well, one, you're brilliant. Oh, but, you are. <laughs> but, 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 thank you. But And two, though, it's so apparent that you do this to serve people. You're coming from your, your heart, like you're in congruence with who you say you are is what you're doing. There's a power to that. I don't think you can transfer to somebody that which you're not experiencing. And so you you can't transfer belief to somebody if you don't have it. If you're in sales, you can't influence someone if you don't really believe in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's such a power because you believe so deeply in what you're teaching because you back it up scientifically. And then it's just obvious you're, you know, you and I both, every hour we spend doing this is not the most lucrative financial hours. We do it because it's our calling, it's our home, it's yeah. our it's in congruence with who we believe we uh, are. Yeah. And that's when we're the most effective. And that's the pathway to you finding your next version of your life for everybody. It's Love that you it. do it for free. Because you and I basically do this for free, right? Exactly. Exactly. Free. And that's why it's so effective because I feel the authenticity and congruency. Well, that's what I'm feeling with you. So thank you for that. And I've back on you. I feel exactly the same thing. That's why this is just such an amazing conversation. And this is only part one, part two, three, four, five, whatever are coming up. So this is this is fantastic. Ed, you've just filled us with hope and happiness and very things that aren't inaccessible. I don't feel like I have to go out there. I feel like it's inside of me. And, and you just say that so well. So thank you for your wisdom and your time and your brilliance as well. And it's been so much fun. And I cannot wait for the next time. It's my honor, and you're coming on my show. So we'll oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Now, how can people get hold of you? Oh, you go to Instagram. If you're on Instagram at Ed Milet, M-Y-L-E-T-T, or edmylet.com, you can find my stuff. And your podcast. Listen, this, your podcasts are fantastic, and your, your, your social media is fantastic. So thank you for what you do for everyone. And so fantastic having you on the show. Thank you so much. My honor. Look forward to the next time.